This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Thank you, uh, Michelle, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. I think I'm going to stand because I can't can't see the people in the back if I if I sit. Um, and everybody's always in the back, right? I mean, that's that's how it, that's how it works. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and it's a chance to talk about something you know that one does all the time, and to think about something that one does all the time, but does it without thinking very much about, and that is mentorship. And Michelle is absolutely right that the uh, that um, you know the inspiration uh, for thinking about mentorship and for my own uh, ideas about it. Uh, come from a wonderful professor here, uh, Wayne Vucinich, uh, who held the chair, in fact, raised the money for the chair that I now hold in East European Studies here at Stanford. Um, so what I wanted to do is to talk about mentorship, um, uh, link it a little bit with teaching, uh, because too often I think we sort of separate teaching from mentorship or don't think enough about mentorship in the teaching uh, when we talk about uh, teaching. I want to, as best I can, and I see some, some historians here, I want to, I want to um, think about mentorship together with history, because it's the discipline that I'm involved with, although obviously mentorship is, is much broader than just, uh, just that, uh, and, and talk about what I call, what I call, what we think about is passing the torch, that is the intergenerational aspects uh, of of mentoring, which is very obviously very uh, important to the subject. So I want to explore those connections a little bit. I have some thoughts here and there, and then hopefully, what do I have? How long do I have? About 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and then I hope uh, I hope to get some questions and some some input from you. Okay, first uh, to mentoring itself. Uh, you know, when I prepared this uh, talk, I tried to find out where did this, uh, where did this idea of mentoring can come from, and it comes from the Greeks, not surprisingly, um, uh, from the Odyssey. Uh, so when Odysseus, you know, king of Ithaca, takes off, you know, to fight uh, the Trojan Wars, uh, he leaves his son, uh, Telemachus, in the hands of one of his oldest and dearest friends, Mentor. Right? And Mentor... Uh, uh, then takes care uh, of Telemachus. Now, the, you know, the Greeks are never easy. Uh, when I went back to take a look at uh, the Odyssey, I realized I'm glad I'm a modern historian because they confuse the hell out of you. You know, gods and goddesses are impersonating. So Athena then, every once in a while, sneaks into this mentor's uh, 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 disguise uh, and does the things that Athena wants to do as mentor. But basically, it's mentor doing them. And what is mentor doing? with young Telemachus. Uh, uh, mentor is helping Telemachus find his own way in life, right? I mean, he is a teacher in some ways and an overseer, but he's not really a kind of tutor. He's much more trying to help, as I say, Telemachus find his own way, help him find his own heritage, help him find his way to his father. Um, and so he's encouraging him on in his own pursuits, in other words, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the sort of prototype of mentoring. The method that he uses is that of establishing trust um, uh, and the kind of uh, feeling of affection uh, with Telemachus. In other words, Telemachus trusts mentor, and that's why, by the way, Athena then comes into Mentor, you know, takes this disguise as Mentor, because she knows that, that uh, Telemachus trusts Mentor uh, and, and has some affection for him, and therefore will listen to what he has to say. Now, what are the lessons, obviously, here uh, for mentorship? They're pretty obvious, right? Uh, first of all, um, you know, the, the best kinds of mentors help students or others, I mean, it's also outside of education, obviously, their mentors, um, helps younger people often, or people with less experience, sometimes they're older, um, find their own way. I read an interview um, with Stanley Falco, who was a, a famous uh, researcher at the medical school, in the Stanford Report. And he talked about mentoring. And it was quite interesting. He said, well, what I do, and if you know Falco, I know him a little bit, you, you, you would get the, get the picture. He says, what do I do? 
he says, well, I talk to students. You know, they come in, uh, and I encourage them to talk about what it is they want to do. Uh, and they talk, and they talk, and they talk. And I listen, and I listen, and I listen. And I sort of nod my head, and he said, they think I'm very wise. Um, and once they get to the end of this, uh, you know, they go ahead and do uh, what they said, you know, they wanted to do. And he said, uh, in this same interview, he said, well, sometimes if I'm a little bit sort of skeptical uh, of their projects, I'll say, and how long do you think this will take? <laughs> right? And, uh, uh, but he says, uh, even, even if they, you know, he, he will never tell them not to do it. Um, and again, he said, he's, that seems to be the job uh, that he does. Okay, well, the second lesson. What's the second lesson in here? I think the method is very interesting. And that is, and, and it, you know, it meets my own experience. And that is of trust and affection. You know that you, you, you cannot have a mentoring relationship, at least I don't feel like it works, without uh, trust uh, and uh, affection. And this is one of the things, by the way, uh, that Vucinich was a kind of, um, you know, a dream about. I mean, he established a kind of sense of trust uh, with his students where, you know, you could do no wrong, right? I mean, uh, you could really do no wrong. And so you trusted yourself then, uh, um, you know, to try things out and to get things wrong sometimes. But, 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 but that bond of affection, you know, made this all uh, work. Without it, I don't think it, it would have worked in the same way. There's one other little story. I need to. I shouldn't spend too much time with the Odyssey, but there's one little story from the mentor Telemachus relationship that was actually uh, important for my own sort of thinking about how to put this together. And that and, and that is is at one point they're off um, on an island, the island uh, of the nymph Calypso, you know, who's this very luscious uh, uh, being. And uh, Calypso is trying to, you know, reel in uh, Telemachus into her little uh, world that Mentor thinks is not good for him. Venus also thinks is not good for him. Um, and he throws, Mentor throws um, Telemachus into the sea where they're picked up by a passing boat and they continue on their journeys. But there's this sense in mentoring that every once in a while, you know, you ha there has to be some tough love. And, you know, tough love is, is very, very difficult. I mean, the, the sort of hard things sometimes that, that need to be said. You know, without the trust and affection, I think, get lost, completely lost. Get, get completely lost. It's almost impossible to do and to have them sink in. But with that trust and affection, when one realizes what's... Uh, what's um, you know what's at stake it works so uh, let me let me now leave mentoring a little bit and, and talking about the teaching at the university listen we're all mentors right I mean they're mentors in some sense at every level uh, of uh, the university I mean, I've seen it as a freshman advisor where my where my sophomore advising assistant will be a mentor to that freshman as well as myself or you try to be a mentor to that freshman they often tend to be actually more of a mentor to the freshmen than we are, because the freshmen are really sort of shaky when it comes to freshman advisors. Um, uh, uh, older uh, upperclassmen are mentors to younger upperclassmen. Graduate students are often mentors to undergraduates. Older graduate students are often mentors to younger graduate students. And we, of course, as professors, try to be mentors to all uh, levels uh, if we possibly can. I want to talk about two uh, uh, sets of relationships in particular, one towards undergraduates uh, and one uh, towards uh, uh, graduate students. I mean, one of the things to say about being mentors of undergraduates, uh, and there are a couple of them here who I've spent some time with uh, and had this, had this experience, is the sheer joy of it. I mean, there, there is I, I can't imagine, you know, greater pleasure, especially than having someone as a freshman, as a quite young student, and then watching them grow over that four-year period as an undergraduate. 
I mean, it's just the simple fact of university life uh, that they come in as kids. Uh, it takes them, you know, not very long to shed their high school habits, but they have to shed them. And they become young adults. You know, and that is just, it's a kind of biological law. You know, that people grow up extraordinarily quickly at the university. And they do wild and crazy things while they're doing it. But, you know, that's part of growing up, right? They're trying things out. So to be a mentor, you know, to, and, and Bob's here, so he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, uh, uh, we've been mentored the same, same young undergraduate. So, uh, so, you know, to watch them choose their majors, you know, sometimes thinking about 15 or 20 of them along the way, actually declaring three or four, thinking about their career choices as they go on, you know, wildly swinging one way and another, although all of it seems to make some sense by the end. You know, it, it's, it's part of the deal. You know, it's, it's a, wonderful, a wonderful part of, of uh, mentoring undergraduates to see this development, you know, to see this, this sense of, of um, uh, um, growing up, you know, as, as individuals as well as of young students and scholars and specialists. I mean, one of the interesting things to me, I have to say, about mentoring undergraduates and how, how intense and sometimes wonderful it can be is they often disappear after graduate school. I mean, I think there are various, I mean, after they graduate. I think there are various reasons for this. I'm not quite sure, you know, what they are. We could talk about those if you feel like it. Uh, I mean, there are relationships that continue. I still have relationships with some of my undergraduates. There were people I taught when, I, when they were undergraduates. But... But to me, and given the intensity of the emotional, you know, the emotional ties, I'm sort of surprised how easily that kind of disappears. And so I've concluded, more or less, not to stop mentoring undergraduates, but that the, that, but that, that the um, essence of it is in the process itself. In other words, it's the process itself of them becoming something, right? And then they don't, essentially, they don't need you anymore, right? But the process is so moving and so, um, and so enveloping, you know, and gives you such satisfaction uh, that, um, you know, it's worth, worth every minute uh, that you put into it. Graduate students are a little different. Uh, graduate students that you mentor, you know, are there for life. <laughs> Sometimes, excuse me to my graduate students who are in this room, uh, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. No, no, that's that that the latter is a joke, a bad joke. It's always for the better. Um, I mean, and there are a number of reasons for this, a clear reasons for this. One, they're in your field, right? They're in your field. So if you go to one of these meetings, like AAA, Double S, right, the Slavic Association meeting, you know, I see my graduate students. We go to conferences together. Uh, go to the symposium together, sometimes work on projects together later on. So, you know, there is opportunity uh, to continue this relationship uh, 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 over time. The other thing is, they need you, right? I mean, the undergraduate who grows up, goes to law school, and is a corporate lawyer, or ends up being a doctor, or whatever ends up doing, I mean, you know, uh, they don't need your letters anymore. Right? And, and the graduate students who then become professionals, you, know, you help, you hope, get them a job. You help, you hope, get them promoted and, and tenured. You help, you hope, get them their book published and their grants. And so that relationship just doesn't end. You know? And um, I'll come back, uh, I'll come back uh, to this uh, a little bit later. But it just goes on. And on. Now, um, there's there's some interesting aspects to these relationships that it, you know. And here I have to say I've been, I'm, I follow or try to follow in the footsteps of Uncle Wayne. We call all called him Uncle, um, and that is that those students whom you've dealt with and whom you've mentored over time, you try to kind of get them together to help each other and to mentor each other. So an almost familial 
aspect of this develops over time. Even with students who don't, haven't necessarily studied together. So my students who are now, you know, off teaching in various places, I try to put in contact with the students who are here now. You know, so that they eventually then can, you know, so that these relationships will develop among cousins and nephews. I mean, we were all nephews and nieces of Uncle Wayne. And in some ways, you know, um, it, it's, a, it's a real model, I think, you know, of how to continue these relationships and nurture these relationships over time. Because I can't do everything, right? And, and often, these students are glad to take on sort of this mentorship of other students. I mean, Uncle called it uh, his Zadruga. Zadruga in, in, in um, South Slav is an extended family. And he had an extended family. And in some ways, I feel like I have an extended family. And, we, and, and Michelle was at the same memorial service I was at, one after another of his extended family. In different professions over different generations got up and talked as his nephew and nieces. And all of us together were part uh, of that family. So to the extent, you know, that, that, that one can nurture something like that and can, and can continue it, you know, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. And I have to say, I never understood until well, fairly recently the pleasure. I knew he took great pleasure in this. I knew this was one of the most pleasurable things for him as a senior scholar. I mean, he used to go in his office. And the conversation would inevitably turn to somebody who was off somewhere accomplishing something or he would just heard from someone who just won this award or had just published this book. And he himself, in the end, by the way, I should say, and uh, you know, I, I think this is you know, not a secret, never published all that much in the way of, I mean, published a lot of books. He had a long bibliography. But it, it was as if those students who were out there were more important than all those books. And I never really quite understood that until now. I mean, I, I understand it. Um, I mean, there's something about um, you know, having, that, uh, having that relationship and having those people out there you know, who you have in some ways uh, affected their lives uh, and, and their professional ambitions uh, you know, is a source of enormous, enormous uh, satisfaction. Okay, uh, let me turn to history a little bit. Uh, now, again, I want to make sure that we all understand that I, I, I don't, you know, every, there's mentorship in every discipline. But as I was thinking about this subject, uh, I kept thinking there's something special about history and mentorship. And so let's talk about history, and then we'll talk to the mentor, mentorship part in a second. I mean, history, from my point of view, I mean, it's many different things. In the university is fundamentally two sort of different kinds of pursuits. Uh, one of the pursuits is, you know, to sort of pass on and think about uh, and develop a sense of, of the importance of this discipline to all of our lives, right? And the importance of history uh, to the world and to your country and to yourself and to making decisions. Now, I don't believe for a second, I don't think any historian does, you know, the old adage of uh, Santayana, that you're, uh, you know, uh, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Um, you know, we're not, we're not necessarily going to make the world better by studying history. We won't necessarily make better decisions because we know history. We're better prepared to make those decisions. We'll be better, you know, better suited to thinking about how to make those decisions, but we're still going to make lousy decisions, and we're still going to get in terrible wars, no matter how much we we uh, we study uh, we study history. Um, Jim Sheehan, uh, one of my colleagues and friends, and uh, 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 and in some ways I have to say a mentor. One of the things I didn't say early on is that even old guys like me and women need mentors too, and so we look, you know, to people to help us. Uh, develop and to help us uh, grow uh, as scholars. And in some ways, he, he, he is a, a mentor. Uh, talks about history, has a nice article, I won't read you long quotes, but he has a, a nice article about history as a moral science. 
And the idea there is that history is, you know, not that you kind of study big moral questions like the Holocaust or, you know, the uh, outbreak of World War I or terrorism, or any, you know, any of these sort of big, big moral issues that in some ways are too easy, you know, to solve. But that history teaches you about everyday men and women making decisions about their lives, about societies moving in one direction or another given you know, the, the proclivities of individuals within it, about good people and bad people and how they act and how they react and how they're formed and how they're shaped. I mean, he sees it, and this is very typical of Sheehan, as a very kind of modest and humble undertaking, undertaking you know, to, to recreate this moral universe, but that we become better human beings become better individuals. We know in our own lives better what to do if we study history. And you know, I believe this very much as well. So this is about studying history. In other words, history is about studying, it's about reading, it's about talking about it. Uh, and it's a very important uh, part of everyone's uh, education. Uh, and uh, we want you know, students to, uh, you know, to do this. Then there's another part of history, and this is the part that graduate students grapple with a lot, uh, uh, young scholars, and even some students who are working on honors thesis and that sort of thing, and that is the notion of creating history. I mean, history as taking something out of nothing and putting it down on paper. I mean, it's not out of nothing exactly, it's out of documents, it's out of other people's writing about history, but it's, it's creating a whole world of the past, but through your own effort. Right, through your own efforts. Um, this is not about studying other people's ideas of history. It's about making history yourself. And that in itself is a very, um, you know, very um, uh, difficult process. It's a creative process, but it's a process that also has rules. I mean, not a lot. I mean, history is not rocket science. It's not rocket science. I mean, there are rules of evidence. The rules of logic uh, and the rules of exposition, right? And you need if you follow those rules, basically, you know, uh, you can do and you can write uh, uh, history. Okay, so taking these two kinds of history, then how does mentoring fit in? Well, for the former, you know, it used to be uh, a whole lot easier at the university to get people to think about. You know, the problem is. The problem is, you know, a lot of our students come out of really crummy secondary school history programs, I have to say, that just numb their brains, right? And that, that think about history as a kind of chronicle of past, past lives, right? I mean, it's, it, it doesn't, I mean, it's not this living science. You know, it's not this living interaction between past and present, this living conversation, as E.H. Carr would call it, between past and present you know, that animates and can animate people in such, a, in, in, in such a wonderful way. They sort of come deadened. We used to have something called Western Civ. And the whole idea was to undeaden them, right? And to say, look, this is really, really interesting and important and relevant. Again, you know, you're not going to change the world. You're not going to stop war or genocide by studying history. But you are going to be able to create a whole new universal way of thinking about uh, the present and the future. We don't have that anymore. We don't have that anymore. Uh, if some history is taught in IHUM, but it's a different ballgame. It's a different ballgame. It's, it's not about history. And so we, you know, one of the things we have to do is convince students, you know, get them into the classroom and find ways you know, that they, that they uh, realize uh, that this is, uh, this is the case. I mean, you don't ha I mean, think about the difference between history and, let's say, econ. Or, I mean, you don't have to convince students, you know, that econ's important, right? I mean, they're trying to get kids out of the department. There's so many of them <laughs> there. Or, you know, students who want to become doctors. You don't have to convince them that biology and chemistry is important. They have to take them, right? Or, um, uh, or, or other, th other, you know, uh, uh, subjects like that. But history somehow seems arcane. Right? It seems like something, as my father used to tell me, isn't that just reading books at night, you know, <laughs> when you go to bed? Uh, um, 
you know, it seems somehow doesn't belong, you know, to what folks ought to be studying. Right? So, so you know, there's a lot of mentoring involved with history. I mean, in the classroom and out. You know, in the classroom, you need to mentor as well. By, by helping students then come to the, re you can't say history is important. It won't do you any good, right? What you have to do is you have to, through the teaching and through the process of, of learning, mentor them, you know, into the process where they think it's important uh, themselves. Uh, graduate students, you know, uh, the other part of history, which mostly has to do with graduate students, but also with undergraduates, is also, you know, a kind of mentoring um, uh, process. I don't think, and again, I hope my students who are here will, will forgive me, I don't, and this comes from my own experience, I don't think there's a group of more insecure, neurotic people on earth than graduate students. <laughs> now, now, now here, here's, here's the problem. Here's the problem, right? I mean, you're still in school, right? You want to be a professional, but you're not there yet. And then you're faced, you know, with this overwhelming, I mean, overwhelming, and this is also true, by the way, of students who are honor students or seniors or people who are trying to be involved in the creative aspects of history. You tell them, okay, it's creative, right? Um, but then all of a sudden they realize there are thousands of books written on these subjects, right? The wealth of information that's out there. I mean, by the time you get to where I am in age, and this is what I'm talking about age, you realize that that intimidation, I mean, I'm still intimidated by how much incredible stuff there's out there that I haven't read and that I'll never be able to read on subjects that are central even to my own uh, uh, narrow scholarly interest. But when you're a graduate student, all of a sudden you say, holy smoke, how can I do this, right? I mean, they're just as smart as I am, right? I mean, they're just as capable. Um, but then they look at professors and they say, I can't do this. Right? There's no way. I mean, they keep doing it. I mean, we pay them to do it. And, and you know, they keep, keep plugging away. But there's, there is this sense, really, that, that, it's, um, that it's overwhelming. So mentoring is an extremely important part of telling them it's not. Right? They can do it, too. I mean, the whole idea, again, is to give courage. Right? Is to give courage to people to do it themselves. Um, so what does this consist of? You know, you, so you ask yourself, well, how do you mentor this? My, my wife calls me a champion schmoozer. And again, I mean, I'm revealing secrets to, to my students with whom I do a hell of a lot of schmoozing with. But, it, but there's all, there's, you know, there's, um, there's purpose to this madness, you know, and to the fact that my, I spend most of my office hours out at Moonbeams talking to students. What do you do? I mean, what did Uncle Wayne do? I mean, what Uncle Wayne did was made it clear to us that he was, you know, he was a normal guy, right? And he would tell stories. And that's what I do. You know, I tell stories. And I make it clear that that same neuroticism, that same insecurity, and that same sense of not knowing what I wanted to do or whether I'd ever get a job. I mean, uh, you know, um, you try to pass on in order to kind of break down that barrier. You know, to break down that sense that somehow, you know, we, meaning the professors, are different than they, meaning the, the graduate students. I mean, the other thing that's important, by the way, um, uh, I think, um, in communicating uh, to graduate students and to undergraduates as well, is that in some ways they're capable of things we're not. Um, and it's important to understand that, that... Um, Every generation, and again, this is specific to history, right? But to other, maybe other disciplines as well. But every generation, you know, has its own concerns. I mean, it grows up with those concerns. It thinks about those concerns. It confronts those concerns. So that those concerns of the generation behind me are ones I can never necessarily absorb in the same way. I mean, ask yourself the question, how can there be 300,000 books about the French Revolution. 
Well, the answer is every generation looks at the French Revolution a little bit differently. And as generations go on, they say, wait a minute, you know, those old crocs, you know, looked at the French Revolution in the wrong way. Because of their experiences, because of their education, because of the concerns of their generation. So, um, you know, mentoring graduate students, uh, a big part of it uh, in history is to convince them of the truth. And the truth is they can do better than we can. They can do better than we can. They can read what we wrote and say, eh, you know, uh, I got a better idea. Right? And, and that, is, you know, that's a really, a really uh, a big, uh, big part of it. Okay, let me uh, conclude now a little bit by, uh, by talking about passing the torch. I already have indicated uh, that I think this is an extremely important part, you know, of, of this entire uh, uh, process. And the truth is, much, much as students think somehow that history is arcane, um, it's also true. I had yet to meet a freshman who says, when I say, what, you know, what do you want to do? Do you have any ideas what you want to do after you graduate from college? None of them say I want to be an historian. Uh, it, it seems weird and out there and unattainable. Um, you know, you know what happens, right? I mean, little kids. I've got a, I've got a wonderful five-year-old, almost five, next week, who wants to be a Power Ranger, right? Or, uh, uh, I mean, fireman every once in a while uh, gets in there and baseball player. Um, then folks grow up a little bit. They go to high school. They want to be a doctor, lawyer. Businessman. They come to college now, you know, whether they want to do, they want to go to NGOs, combine it with a medical degree, they want to, they want to, um, uh, you know, eliminate poverty, uh, combine it with economics and law degree, and they want to do, uh, they want to go into electronics uh, immediately. No more degrees, <laughs> you know, make a lot of money, or at least it used to be that way. But very few say, I want to go to graduate school and be a historian. So in some ways, you know, mentoring is about convincing the undergraduates, you know, that they can do this. They can do this. I mean, again, in my own case, I mean, this is a, a, a you know, com comes from, from personal experience. You know, I was a senior at Stanford. I loved history. And again, think about the two different kinds of history. I hadn't done much of the creative part at all. I did the other part. You know, I read it, thought about it. And life, made, you know, made my life exciting. I love to think about Nazis and and uh, you know war and uh, Vietnam and uh, terrorism and all these kinds of things. But I had no idea about the creative enterprise uh, uh, of history at all. And um, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. You know, sometimes I thought a school teacher maybe teach history. You know, because that you know a, a school teacher doesn't have to create history. You know, I mean, it seems natural thing to do. Maybe raise dogs in Pescadero. In those days, land was cheap and life was easy. When I at Stanford at the end of the '60s, no more, right? Um, I mean, I had various ideas. So I saw Uncle Wayne, and he said, "Why don't you come to graduate school in history and be an historian?" I kind of you know, shook my head and I said, "What?" <laughs> and and so he said, "Yeah, you know, you you do pretty well in the classroom, and you know, you're a good student. Why don't?" You seem to like it. I said, oh, I love it. And he said, well, why don't, you, why don't you study history? And eventually I did, and eventually I figured out the creative enterprise. Um, and similarly, with undergraduates today, I think that it requires a lot of mentoring to convince them you know, that they can be historians, that they can be historians, and that they can do this as well. And the same thing with graduate students. You know, even though they've made the decision they want to be historians, they don't really believe they can do it. You know, they don't really believe it, a lot of them. Uh, there's a kind of, you know, and, and part of it has to do, again, with this overwhelming sense, this overwhelming sense of, um, of, uh, of the literature. You know, the, the sheer number of books, you know, the, sh the sheer volume of the knowledge. And, and you need to try as best you can, um, you know, to convince them that they, that they uh, can do it and that they can do it they can do it better. 
Um, and once, you know, once they're convinced of that, um, you know, then all's clear. I mean, part of the mentoring business, let me say again, has to do with trust. And has to do with, has to do with affection. Because if that is not there, then some of the crucial things that they need to know, which is they have to work hard, right? They have to write and rewrite and rewrite again. Um, that sometimes they don't get things right. Um, that all of that, you know, if you don't, again, I think if you don't have it, it doesn't work very well. It just doesn't work very well. You can't say, you know, George, this is garbage. You've got to start over again. If you've established a relationship, you know, if you've got a, if you have a, if you have an ongoing sort of sense of commitment one to the other, um, then it does work. And graduate school, if nothing else, is kind of criticism, criticism, criticism. Right? And being a scholar, by the way, if nothing else, and you've got to convince graduate students of this too, is nothing if not self-criticism and self-criticism and self-criticism. I mean, what do you do? You know, you write and you rewrite and you rewrite and you rewrite until you think you've got it right. And you ask people to read it and go for it. You don't want people just to read it and say it's fine. Right? So that process, you know, is what I think uh, turns out a uh, 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 wonderful historian. So let me, let me just conclude, uh, again, a little bit, a little bit uh, 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 anecdotally, a story which is very uh, is is a mundane story that repeats itself over and over again, but in some ways I think um, is um, you know summarizes what I want to say today. Uh, many times students, not so much the younger ones, but the older ones, or those who have left, to say, "Oh, Norman," or sometimes Professor Neymark. They can't get over the Professor Neymark. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to see. You know, some of them go forever and call me Professor Neymark. And some of them, you know, are pretty easy with my first name. Doesn't, you know, I don't care. So Norman, let's say. Norman, I have to ask you for another letter. Please forgive me. I got, you got to write another letter. I'm applying for yet another grant. You know, it's the 12th one this year. And, uh, you know, please would you write the letter. And I apologize. And I'm sorry. And can, is it okay? And, you know, and my response is always absolutely. I'll do it. You know? And I also tell them why. I said, you know, when I was a student and when I was a professor, people wrote letters for me until they were blue in the face. Right? I, I don't know how, you know, uh, Uncle Wayne's files, and this was a man who easily had 40 or 50 scholars out there who depended on him, you know, I, uh, uh, for this kind of support. Right? I mean, his file cabinet. I was there, you know, when they started putting his archive together and stuff like that. His file cabinets, and they didn't computers in those days, right? Were filled with these letters, you know, copies and copies of all of these letters, hundreds, thousands and thousands of these letters. Um, so I always say, absolutely. And you know, what do you what do you think about? I mean, I, sometimes I do. I think about because it, it's a lot of work. It takes a huge amount of time. I mean, mentoring is no joke, right? I mean, it's not just a cup of coffee once in a while. It really takes a lot of your time and effort. And it, but if you think of it again as part of the teaching and the scholarly process, you know, and what you get out of it, then, then, it, doesn't, then it, it, it doesn't bother you. So one of the things I think is happening, and one of the things I hope is happening, is that these young folks will do exactly the same things for their students. In other words, if what Uncle Wayne passed on to me, I can never repay. Right? I can never repay. There's no way. But in a small way, you know, this is, a, this is kind of doing what he wanted to do. Right? It, which is to build groups and communities and affinity groups, as Goethe would say, or self-chosen affinities, right, uh, of historians uh, dedicated, you know, to Cleo. You know, the goddess of history and this the muse of history and, and this wonderful thing that we do and this wonderful thing that we all uh, share together. So in the end, I think uh, that's the bottom line of my story. I mean, if you add to it um, Mentor and Telemachus and Cleo, then you've got a happy little trio and uh, may we live forever. Thank you.
So I'll be glad to take questions, comments, suggestions. Oh, please. Yeah. Well, maybe I will add, Norman. You've argued so eloquently for how mentors are lifelong relationships. But I, I remember the day that Professor Vucinich invited me to have lunch with him and his graduate, his former graduate student, who is now retiring from his academic career. And I think he was probably 70, and Wayne at the time was probably 28. And I remember thinking, oh my god, he's, Wayne has not only finished his career, but he's having lunch with, the, with one of his graduate students who's finished his career. <laughs> and it's just, it makes you realize that it is a lifelong. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and again, the interesting part of it, I mean, there are lots of interesting parts of it, but the pleasure you take. I mean, the pleasure you take. I mean, I think I mentioned uh, to you, maybe the, uh, the other day, that uh, uh, I gave a talk at Princeton in December or something on my work. Uh, the person who invited me was one of my first former students from BU days. Um, a former undergraduate. I mean, you get great pleasure when an undergraduate then goes on to the to study history in your field. It, it doesn't happen very often at Stanford. I mean, I think one of the things we need to ask ourselves in history and maybe in other departments, I don't know, is that our students don't tend to go on as professionals. I mean, it used to be different. I mean, when I graduated uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the 60s, I mean, a large numbers of people went on to graduate school. And it may just have to do with the job market and, you know, relative salaries and things like that. I don't know. I mean, that, that I won't touch. So there was a, a, a former student of mine, former graduate student, invited me, a former undergraduate who was studying there, I had dinner with. There were two former Stanford uh, history students who had studied with me who are in Princeton, uh, graduate students uh, now. Um, so, you know, you get this, this wonderful sense then of a, of a, a real community, um, you know, and, and again, of, of elected, what's it called, elected affinities? Am I getting the Gertha right, right? The elected affinities, you know, um, where, I mean, the sense of satisfaction is just hard to, is hard to measure and hard to beat, hard to beat. And, and it's true, it goes on, it goes on forever. Part of it, again, you know, you can't, you can't completely separate it from issues of interest and, and need, I mean, I mean, my email today was filled with, you know, one of my former students has got her book accepted for publication and she has to respond to criticisms. And, you know, you read the, you know, you help them get it submitted. You read the reader's reports. You help them respond to the reader's, you know. So, so and, and part of it is that professional life, I mean, this is, this is nobody's fault. Professional life. For historians, I think this is probably true for any any discipline. You know, has a lot of unwritten rules. It's not as if you can sit down and sort of read a book and say, this, "Now I understand how this all works." Um, there are lots of unwritten rules, and unless you've experienced this over time, you know, it's very hard to know what those rules are and how you're supposed to respond. So if somebody asks me, "How do I respond?" I I tell them what I think. You know. Um, and, but again, this comes out of uh, out of long um, experience with these former students now, uh, and I expect that to last for as long as uh, I can enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. I have I have two questions. Um, one is you were talking about the pleasure, right? But sometimes there are also tough situations. Yeah, what frustration? Tough, tough situations yes, where you have to, or where you feel very strongly, for instance, someone shouldn't do this. Right. And I wonder if you have comments about this. And the second thing, if I may, um, you were talking about the transition between undergraduate and graduate students and the sense of being overwhelmed with, with all the books. What about the transition? And you know what I'm asking right. is, between being a graduate student and being an assistant professor. Right. When you have all of a sudden... <laughs> right, there's a different kind of overwhelm. Yeah. Right, okay. 
I mean, you're always overwhelmed. I mean, as a historian, you have to be. Over I mean, listen, the past is huge. I mean, it's immense. It's endless, right? It's infinity. So th there is no not being overwhelmed. It's how you deal with being overwhelmed. That's the, that's the essence of it. OK. Um, uh, yeah, tough love. It, it's hard. It is hard. And, and there have been, you know, there have been times uh, where I have felt, I must say, I'm very much, I'm very sympathetic to the original kind of mentor design, and I'm sympathetic to what Falco said. Sometimes I'd rather have the students make the mistakes themselves than intervene, even though I know it may be a mistake. There's sometimes, though, I feel, you know, the obligation. I mean, I'm just going to tell you how I feel. I don't, I don't want to theorize any of this. Um, I feel the obligation to sort of step in. This often happens with writing. I mean, it's one of, it's one of the, I think, the things that we do worse with at the university. I mean, my view is undergraduates don't know how to write, and then we get graduate students here who also don't know how to write. And, and, and sometimes it's such a shock to them. You know, to tell them after all these A's they've gotten and all these papers they've done that they can't write for you know what, and um, and that they have to start from scratch. And it's not easy. And 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 by the way, it's not easy for people to then relearn writing the proper way. It can be learned. I mean, it it, it it's just a, you know, and I have it, it, and I tr I try to do it in different ways. I mean, you have methods. And the methods work over time. First of all is the method of saying, okay, this is unacceptable. You write, you're writing bad. You know, and I've had three or four reactions to that that have been quite serious. You know, I mean, people who are really kind of back on their heels. At the same time, I usually don't do that unless the bonds of trust and affection both ways are well established. Because if they're not, again, you know, people can get insulted, they can get hurt, they can go to a different professor, <laughs> they can do all kinds of things. So that's why I think that method is so important. You know, even the, again, the schmoozing method, if you want to call it, uh, any kind of method, you know, which is just being there to talk, you know, about various kinds of things so that a sense of trust is built. Um, you know, every once in a while, people have to be told this just doesn't work. You know, and that's intellectually, and that's even harder than the writing. I mean, writing, you can sort of say, is you know, a skill you have to acquire. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it's the thinking. Or it's, you know, there's sometimes there's laziness. I might have been blessed with wonderful students, you know, so that I've, I've not had to take a bullwhip to anybody. But, um, uh, but, you know, if I think about Uncle Wayne, too, you know, he sometimes gave bad grades. He sometimes bad gave, gave bad grades, and no one would ever dare complain. You know, in part, because he loved you, you know. So how could you possibly complain, right? Uh, um, you know, but as a wake-up call, you know, to doing what's necessary. So I guess I think about that that process. It, it it's not easy, and you know, sometimes I I have conversations with my wife and saying, you know, I just got something from X, you know, and it's really bad. And what should I do? And should I tell them? She usually says yes. Um, and, but I think that's the right thing to do. I mean, it's clearly the right thing to tell them. But you also need to have that bond. And I think, again, that bond is, is extremely important. Without it, then it becomes, I mean, maybe some people could. I've had professors who've taught me without that bond. I could, famous Germanist who was here a long time ago. Uh, you know, basically scared the hell out of graduate students. We did what we could, you know, to, to earn his favor. But there was no, you know, there was no sense of anything. Well, I also fled, you know. I mean, I went a different way, you know. I mean, Uncle Wayne was always there, you know, to kind of pick up any pieces uh, that were there. I remember once he went, I, maybe I told you this story, once I went into my oral exams, you know, he, he was standing out front kind of crossing him, orthodox crossing him. So it didn't make me feel any better that he, <laughs> that he, was, pray, that he was praying for me. But, uh, but, you know, there was that sense that he was on your side. And that, that's, very, that's very important. 
The second question is a really good question. And I don't think people think about it very much. And everybody experiences the same trauma. And the trauma is, first of all, writing lectures, getting lectures ready. Because everybody has to lecture. And even if you try, as I do, not to use your notes during a lecture, or you try just to talk to the students, you've got to prepare. And all of a sudden, you know, three times a week or twice a week, in my case, at BU, I'll, I mean, I'll never forget it. I finished my thesis, you know, and got in my car with my dog and girlfriend and headed to Boston. And, and you know, class started the next week in Kievan and Muscovite Russia, you know, about which I knew nothing. And uh, so, you know, you're up to three or four in the morning. You know, you're faced with having to perform every day in front of a group of students. Um, it's just one of those things you have to go through. And then, again, all the unwritten rules. So we try in the history department, I think in other departments as well, to have mentors for junior faculty. We have officially assigned mentors for junior faculty. And I have mentored junior faculty in much the same way, you know, and they're different issues. But it's about the unwritten rules. You know, can I do this? You know, should I do that? Um, how am I ever going to get tenure? You know? Uh, and so. That, that's why I say mentoring just doesn't end. I mean, you'll need a mentor when you go. You'll need somebody to, to talk to you. And if, if they don't officially assign them, as we now do, then you need to seek one out, find someone with some affinity. It's interesting, though. I mean, uh, I realize I'm going on and we have to stop pretty soon. But, but it's interesting the extent to which my former students, former graduate students, still come to me and not to somebody in their department. Because they're afraid, you know. I mean, there is this, this is the fear factor, too. You know, am I going to do something that will violate one of these norms I don't even know about, right? So, um, but, but, but you're better off. And I often tell people, you know, find somebody in that department who you can talk to. Um, and they often do. They often do. Because if they're used to a mentoring relationship, right, that's the other thing to say. If you're used to a mentoring relationship, then you can be a mentor yourself. I mean, having been mentored so beautifully by this wonderful man that both Michelle and I knew, um, I think I know better how to be a mentor. But also, if you've been mentored, uh, then you'll know how to be mentored again. Right? I hope that's helpful. This is, by the way, I should say I did not read any articles in pedagogy journals about mentorship or any. I did read The Odyssey. That seemed worth doing. <laughs> Bob, did you want to say something or no? Oh, no, I was just going to, you, you sort of implied you don't turn anybody down for letters of recommendation. And uh, I think if that were the case, I would do nothing but uh, letters, of letters of recommendation. Well, um, uh, a graduate student. A graduate student. In other words, any graduate student uh, I, who's worked with me, if I hadn't told them already that they probably shouldn't be there, then, then I had made a mistake early on. So any graduate student. Undergraduate, I mean, I must say 95% of them uh, I say yes to. I mean, it's a rare case where I'll say, you know, I don't, but usually what I'll say is I don't know you well enough or you haven't taken any. I mean, some students, when you, you know, they're in a big lecture class and they got a B plus and they say, will you write me a letter of recommendation? And I said, what can I say? You know, you got a B plus in my class and you seem like a nice person. Um, so. Uh, but uh, graduate students, I think, um, you know, this is, this is a real obligation uh, to support them and to support their interests in, in you know, developing professionally. Um, I think we'll have to end there, though. I know we would all like to go on. So thank you so much thank for you. being here. Thank you. 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 Thank you.